task because then I know to what extent I need to start from the beginning or what the basic premise is. For whom is this the first, the first, uh, the first event that you've attended? How many hands up? Okay, hands up, hands up. Let me see. About a quarter of the people, maybe a little more. Okay, so I'm going to summarize extremely quickly what the situation is. Uh, Verbal, and then I'll show you slides, and this will permit me to go very quickly through the slides when they come in. Now, I warn you about one thing, which is we work to the last moment. You know, we're not always preparing presentations. We work, 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 work. There's about seven or eight people up there. We work, and then at the very last moment, we take them off the table and show them to you. As a, as a consequence, we get a lot of work done, but also the presentations are always out of order. <laughs> because that takes a very long time. So this is not presentation oriented, this is really, you know, work oriented, just like we promised. It's as if we were walking around the tables. And I promise you, having seen the presentation, it's gonna come down and we'll see. Um, uh, but what's also typical of this thing, about 45 minutes ago, 45 minutes ago, we began looking and said, well, what have we done in terms of security? Like, are we thinking about lights? Are we thinking about the cars? And I said, actually, we haven't been thinking about this at all. And so we said, well, let's go and see what comes up. And we actually did a rendering that shows a very elegant way. Uh, in fact, it's the single most elegant drawing. It's one that actually takes care of having the cars actually locked up at night. It's one of the things that's important. You know, I think, I think in this place, if you walk the streets, if you have lights and so forth, when you leave your car alone at night, the street, it's something else, you know, poor car. And so we, we added this to that. Uh, in terms of a summary, this is a project that's about six acres, which is a site with two sort of quasi-industrial buildings, about 100 years old, that were donated by Entergy to the East Baton Rouge Redevelopment Authority. And our task was to make that both valuable, but also positive to the neighborhood. There's a very large super plot associated with it that, as, as you'll see in the scale comparisons, is actually larger than Seaside. It's one of the scales we did. It's also about the size of half the French Quarter from the Mississippi right up to the railway track, you know, in, in, uh, in New Orleans. It's a very large area. You wouldn't know it because it's so gap-toothed and, you know, um, I am told by people who grew up there there was really a nice place to grow up. But it's, it's generally decayed at the moment. Um, it has assets. There's at least seven churches, one of which is so close to our site, the Little Rock Baptist, that we went ahead and designed uh, them not only a not only did we include their land in the project, we actually designed them a new church. And the reason is that you can tell that their church, which is essentially a converted uh, shotgun, is actually inadequate. So uh, taking their land, you'll see that we, we very much included them in the, in, in the scheme. Um, but the real assets are there, the great school, which I you always laugh when I pronounce it, but something like Dufrock. Yes. All right. Good job. Okay, it's the fraud. And, uh, and then the other thing is the pretty substantial Shiloh Church that has its own development ideas, you know, and uh, what's the, uh, the street, Robinson? Robinson Street? Eddie Robinson. Eddie Robinson Street has a, uh, they, have, they have an access in which they gradually want to purchase properties and connect some civic buildings up and down. So there's a couple of overlaid agendas. There's, there's the energy site, and then Shiloh Church, and then the school has some issues. Uh, that we were distracted. The school, fortunately for us, was not a problem. It's one of the uh, really higher rated schools here. It's what I would say a really good school, so it's a great asset. It does have a drop-off problem. You know, uh, a lot of confusion. And on the side, and quite independently, we tried to solve that problem. You know, how do you drop off kids and buses at the same time? It's actually very simple to do. If, um, if um, I suspect that from the looks of it, the, 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 uh, the principal is listening to too many people. And he's got a hybrid solution. And there's half the people do this, the other half people do that, but people forget what they're supposed to do. 
but uh, we propose a very simple solution. I'm not going to emphasize it. But the last time, you may know that a lot of our question time Q&A was spent with the school. And in the end, the only problem with the school was a drop-off. Are you recording? And we don't want to uh, hold this up by that problem, so we did have a design. Now, uh, this project is uh, four days old. Uh, the very first day when I presented, I already showed you two projects, two, two, uh, uh, two different schemes. Uh, one of them was what I would call the standard issue new urbanist scheme. You know, uh, substantial buildings with the parking in the back, mixed use. You've seen the River Ranch as an example of, uh, of a really good, in Lafayette, is of a really good new urbanist scheme. Uh, and then there was another one that was more innovative, that actually was much more pavilion-like, much less formal, and actually, and this is the word that I kept using, actually much cooler. It's a much cooler scheme than basically a proper town. This scheme was cooler, partially because we wanted to implement here what's called a pink zone, which is a zone in which the red tape has been reduced in order to allow younger and smaller developers to operate. And one of the things that I suspected, because it happens all over America, is that you have to be a very big developer to be able to afford the process. You know, there's a huge process, and I'll show you a horrible diagram of the new simplified process, which actually looks like the D-Day invasion diagram. <laughs> it really was, this is the invasion. Day one, day two, day three, except instead of days, this is months between the meetings. So one of the things we have we have in front of us is a, a regulatory situation, both the codes and the processes that regular younger folk with smaller businesses literally can't operate. And if we don't simplify this thing, it's all going to go to the big developers. The big developers that will take, listen, I'll take this off your hands. I'll build you the 600 units, I'll follow all your rules, and I gotta have all 600 or I can't do it because it takes much too long to get anything done. So, uh, one of the things that we wrote up today with the help of my internet friends was a, an ordinance called uh, the pink zone, you know, the, the pink overlay zone, as I said, reducing red tape. And we had the fortune uh, yesterday of having the fellow, uh, Okay, John Fragonese, who is actually rewriting this code, cleaning up the code for, uh, as it happens, as it happens, cleaning up the code for Baton Rouge. And so we said, among the things we'd like you to do is to have a pink zone in, in place for a five-year period. Now, I could go on and on the entire presentation on this pink zone. Okay, the pink zone could be, it's extremely exciting, it's extremely innovative, and we, for the first time we're having some real documents here but I'm just gonna, maybe I'll mention it. The main effect it has is that the, how the, 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 the units are smaller and the units are, um, um, I think, much more diverse. So what else now? As you can see, my presentation hasn't come in, right? <laughs> okay. And just because I wanna let you into things. Um, the, very cool scheme is so light on the ground and so open. It's a series of pavilions, relatively small pavilions, that actually it's unsecurable. You know, the cars are just wherever they land. In fact, the closest analogy, if you've ever been to Vancouver and seen uh, Granville Island, it's an island that was an industrial island, and there were warehouses that were left and they were gap to some warehouses were gone. And there is no order. There's a whole bunch of warehouses, and then whatever space is in between, the people park in for home. So the idea of this parking is that instead of designing a super efficient parking lot, you know what they look like, Walmart, you know, is the expert, that is a park that is a parking lot, whether the cars are there or not. Okay, so you know, even when the cars are gone, you say it's all parking lots, horrible, I hate it, I hate the asshole. What we took, what we had in mind was a series of, of plazas of the kind they have in Europe that when the, it's a plaza, designed first as a plaza, when the cars are on it, it's still a plaza, and when the cars are gone, it's even better. 
And what you find continually in Europe is people in these relatively small room-like spaces sitting around with 8, 10, 12, 15 cars on cafes, outside of cafe tables, feeling fabulous. <laughs> I love Italy, it's fabulous. And yet, you know, you say, don't you see that this is also a parking lot? And that's the ideal. That's what we need to do in the United States now, since the cars are not going to go away for a generation or two. And besides, they really shouldn't go away. They're pretty cool. What we really hate are the parking lots. We don't hate our cars. We hate our parking lots and our traffic jams. Okay? So if we can actually have walkable environments that you don't have to use the car to get to places, then you're not suffering from the first thing, the traffic jam. And if we actually use the budget of the parking lots to make plazas, you know, the pavement and the trees and all this stuff, and all the drainage, parking lots are expensive. We sort of shove all this money down the rat hole, and we end up with a parking lot that everybody hates. But why not take that budget and make a whole bunch of little squares? And what that has to do is how you lay out the buildings. Okay, you lay them out. Um, the last thing that I think I can actually emphasize today is that, and this is a little bit disturbing, uh, this project was very intensive in terms of studies, which is to say, who needs this stuff? You know, who are the demographics? Are they young? Are they old? Are they, you know, are they from here? Are they, are they the new IBM employees? Do they need office built? Do they need more office space? Do they need shops and all that? More and more, I've realized that to have planners come in and tell you what things are going to be is a false utopia. We don't have the power you know, to tell you, well, this is going to be a market, and this is the affordable housing, and this is the other housing. No matter what happens, when the studies come in, it's not what you think. And so what we've learned over time is to only design that which is important, and that which isn't, we let go. So for example, you will see project after project in which there are pretty standard fo footprints, and then you do a plug and play. Like, would you like to build it in? By all means, plug in the in. Would you like to do a, an office building? By all means, plug in the office building. Would you like to do 15 townhouses? Well, let's say townhouses with, let's say, 18 foot widths, plug those in. If you want 24 inch, plug those in. So one of the projects is it very thoroughly worked out plug and play, in which you can literally take you know, the prefabricated drawings we've done, almost like, a, like a, the menu of a, um, of, a, a, of a restaurant, you know, so long as it comes on a plate of a certain size. Have you noticed that restaurants have one size plate? And the way which you put on it is amazing. You can have ribs and you know, you can have scrambled eggs and all this stuff in the same plate. That's what our sites are like. We have the sites worked out so that depending what you come in with, we have a self-healing, self-solving thing. This is what works there, this is what you can park. Okay, so that's the plot. The plot is, don't worry about what we are, when we're imprecise, because it actually it's pretty cool that regardless of what you put in, it's, it's urbanism. But then one additional thing happened. You heard that we had, this was entirely a two-story project. We tested it and we tested it and we realized that the parking determined, the parking ratio, that you never needed more than two stories. Okay? And you'll see a lot of drawings today that are two stories. <coughs> and then just this afternoon, somebody came in and said, what about that right-of-way of the power company that is running along the railway track, where we had put a lot of buildings? And we looked at the right-of-way and we realized that with its easement, you couldn't put any buildings. So we have a whole swath up and down the site, almost 200 feet wide, that can be nothing except parking lot. <coughs> nothing except parking. So suddenly we have a wretched excess of parking. So we have the parking that we park on the sites for the two-story structures. And then we realize that we have enough parking off-site, flexibly available, that we can go three and four stories. So that's kind of interesting. And so the last drawing you'll see is actually a three-story scheme. And, uh, and that's, that's, one of the, that's, what, that's what charrettes are. Like you have to stir the pot and tell you uh, what's going to happen. Now, 
I think what may have happened is that the computer ate my <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, we just have to wait. Are you, uh, do you have any questions? You'll see the drawings, but do you have any questions? Any worries? What are the surprises you discovered? Well, I discovered that. Um, well, you know, the old joke is that nobody's cool in Baton Rouge, right? We know we're not cool. We, we understand this is cool, but we're not. We're not cool. And, uh, and I don't think so, actually. There's more and more evidence of the kind of place that you see in the radio bar, you know, where people are hanging around a certain way. And so, besides, uh, and here's the, although this project happened very quickly, in many ways it's not, it's not so quick that it's for us, get it? You know, this is urbanism, you know, 10 to 15 year build out, and uh, it's, it really has a lot more to do with the next generation of what they consider cool and interesting and not what we consider. And I think one of the really shocking things about the, what's happened since we were pioneering traditional architecture, you know, we were pioneering uh, traditional houses. I don't know whether you know, but the first straight, the first, other than people like A. Hayes Town, the first straight vernacular architecture done in the late 20th century was at Seaside. There was a lot of postmodernism, but it was Seaside that actually said, let's, just, let's do it straight without any irony. So that was incredibly radical. Got a lot of people like that, so sort of angry. That was the, the really cool thing. And what's happened since is that there's a generation coming up now that really likes modern architecture, particularly in single family houses. And they love glass and dwell magazine which talks about that is now thicker than our potential digest, right? Of course, of course, gun and garden is fighting back. <laughs> and the South has not given up traditional architecture. But even uh, if you look at uh, architectural digest now, from half to two thirds of the buildings are modernist. And so one of the things that has become very, very difficult in our presentations is that um, is how, what image you give to the architecture? You know, well, it used to be extremely easy to say, do a traditional building. People recognize the windows and the pitch roofs. You're okay. That's not necessarily the case. But you've got to draw something. So, what generally what we've done is either quite neutral stuff, or when we have to put windows in, we we've, we've actually put the, the traditional architecture in. It's a lot easier to design. It's a lot easier to design. It's also, by the way still today less expensive to build. You know, it doesn't require so much special material. But I would say that the original vision of this was places that had, uh, you know, glass garage doors that opened up, you know, sliding doors, things like that, that were, you know, that are really, it's what's really happening now in terms of retail. You know, that's really what's happening. So what have we got? Ready? Yeah. Okay. Let's see what we have. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so uh, existing conditions. Um, this is what we were given by contract. This is the C acre, the, the, the six or so acre site. This was considered the original area of influence uh, straddling the railway track. And over here, just outside, is a Shiloh church. Over here is the school. And then there's a super block between North Boulevard and the highway. Government Street in 22nd, which is an enormous piece of ground. And it's amazing how in America we have so much large pieces of ground that have so little consequence. And that's what is really sort of urbanism. You know, we have a bunch of houses that don't add up. But you'll see the scale comparisons, it's remarkable. So we mapped it, you know, we really, uh, we really put in what's there. And we did analysis like this. These are the assets, these are the churches and the schools, etc. So there are lots of assets, um, and uh, they're, all, they're all relatively small. The largest thing going on the site is the, without doubt, without doubt, the energy, the energy building, which is located right at the center. Okay, so if you look at this, uh, at the historic significance, at the, the buildings of historic significance, what is this? I guess this is, this is, oh no, I'm sorry, it's here. So this is a historic district, this is a historic district, we don't have a historic district other than the school. 
So there's not that much to actually that's that we have to be delicate about. This is New Orleans in which there's a strong context. Okay, uh, there's a bike path, there's a bike system that we're going to bring through and into the site, particularly if the railway track uh, uh, permits us to, to, to go through. This is the original scheme we did. It proved to be incredibly accurate when we look at it now. This is something we did. We came through a three-day scheme and we did a sketch very quickly. And this is what we found. This is our site, the six acres we'd like to connect to the terrific school here. There is a street going north, which has an enormous number of empty spaces, and a successful redevelopment over here. And then there is what comes in from Beauregard Town, and the new budget that the DDD has to, to light and they basically sanitize the experience of going underneath the highway. So at certain points, going underneath the highway, I-110, it's going to be okay. It's going to feel okay to do this. So it's not impossible to connect from Beauregard Town. This is the bike path, which is currently running miserably on, uh, on North Boulevard, but would actually could run gently within a much more pedestrian-friendly uh, place. And lastly, this north-south access from the Shiloh Church and their, uh, and their uh, they have um, a meeting hall up here. There was an old Masonic temple and then down to another, another uh, quasi-historic building of cultural value to them. Now, what are these axes? This is what goes first. And we don't want a hodgepodge of, I'll fix this, I'll fix this. We'd like to complete the whole streets. That's very important. Uh, there's been some great successes in revitalization along street axes, two of them. If you've been to Havana, that's what they do. They complete a whole street in a very disciplined way. The rest is not used, and Charleston did it as well, as did Miami Beach. This is an analysis of the quality of pedestrian experience. The darker the line, the worse it is. It's a, it's a lousy place to walk so far. Uh, these are the infill opportunities. These are open lots and parking lots, immediately available. Uh, this, these are the parking lots. And we can say, we normally say, what a shame not to use the parking lots, right? We've got to put everything in parking garages and liberate the lots for redevelopment. I'm afraid to say that the parking lots are here to stay because the value of the real estate here cannot amortize a parking garage. So our task was how do we, how do we create an urbanism that is entirely surface parking? And whenever you see somebody propose a parking garage, you're talking about deep subsidies, and you're talking about probably somebody who's still thinking about the 20th century and not the 21st, uh, where we're a lot more broke. And by the way, just about being broke in the 21st century, how about that price of oil going down? You know, this place was one of the wealth was flowing through Louisiana, and you know, it can stop from one month to the next. And so it's always better to bet with what costs less. You know, more of a 19th century attitude than a 1990s or 2000 attitude. Okay, so the parking requirements are, what is this? I have no idea what this is. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry, this is a different scale. This is the energy site. This is the energy site. Okay. So, this is what happened here. I just want to say one thing. This was like pretty interesting. So this fellow comes in, he's done an enormous study about the market. And he says, what this place really needs are three-story office buildings of 25,000 square foot floor plan. 25,000. 25,000 is exactly what they build out in the suburbs. It's you know, an enormous monster. And so we were arguing, is this the right thing, is not the right thing, he kept insisting. All we had to do was draw his 25,000 square foot floor plate and the parking associated with it and we realized, wow, that's all we need to do. That's all that fits is one office building there on the site. Now, the reason I bring this up is that this would be the easy thing to do, right? You sell it to somebody that has a strong market. The office building is like a spaceship. It doesn't care where it is, right? Because the people come in straight from their, from their offices into the elevators, into the parking garage. They don't care where they are. They never touch the sidewalk. So they could be anywhere. And one of the things that redevelopment agency can do, authority can do, is flip it 
and just fill its coffers very quickly to somebody else's problem. And that's exactly what they're, that's the easy thing to do, but that's not what we can do. Because we have a, a there is a charter to actually, actually heal the neighborhood. But I think it was pretty interesting to see how easily we could just do one thing. Now this diagram, this is our site, this diagram shows the new area of influence. See, the old area of influence was this patch. So our charge was fix this and then fix this patch. And as I just described to you, no, what we want to do is fix the frontage that connects us to the school, fix the frontage that connects us, us to the good project up here, you know, with the gym and the civic facilities, which are mostly empty lots, go over, connect the Beauregard town, and then help the church, the Shiloh church, to connect along its axes. So if this happens within five years, the perception of this place will be fantastic. It has to be very disciplined. In other words, if you, if you have a, a lot to buy, if you have a budget to do something, if you come in and say, which house should I renovate? You say, build on these gray lines. And don't encourage and dissipate your effort by pockmarking it everywhere, because it just won't add up. Lots of evidence about failure in that regard. Okay, so the precedence. Uh, this is something that opened in Miami two weeks ago, and I think people like my friend Nathan Norris here, who's one of the planners from Lafayette, has been hearing endlessly from me about a place called Wynwood. And Wynwood is the coolest thing in Miami. It's a bunch of warehouses with graffiti. You know, and we all go there, and it's cheap, and it's great, and it's hot. Well, a new thing came up uh, two weeks ago that just blew the doors off. And it's called Ironside. And it's on a railway track, ironically enough. It's in a pretty mediocre neighborhood. And what they did is they took a warehouse, made a little space, and just, met, and just filled it with um, really well-selected restaurants and really well-selected uh, bands and, and people who are merchants who are very cool, who have friends. And so this thing opened. And in our Basel, that has about you know, 120,000 people showing up, this was the place to get in. And when I went to it, I said, this is even cheaper and less expensive. Look, here's in Miami, you see that, that palm tree in Miami? There are no palm trees that small in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> this is like really low budget. You know, a scraggly tree, the old pavement, and you know, aluminum storefronts all along the side, and just really cool people. Very laid back. Very little architecture. People are tired of architecture. You know, it's Frank Gehry and Frank Gehry Jr. and Frank Gehry Jr. Jr. And, you know, and I have to say, the housing that was built uh, to the north of us, which is delaminating slightly, you know, you know that look, the materials are like that, well, it's not even cool anymore. I mean, it's just, like I looked at it and said, oh yeah, well, that was last year. And I think what's happening now is something that can be called the new matter of factness. You know, let's just be matter of fact we want architecture to leave us alone. Liz just did a project for the most, for the most uh, I think this is worth telling. Liz just did a project for uh, the, the number one retailers in the world, Louis Vuitton, LVMH, I mean, unbelievable people. And our advisors, our retail advisors, were from Paris. And so these incredibly cool young men showed up and said, well, what we want is no architecture. And so Liz did her best to do no architecture. They came back and said, no, no, we actually need no architecture. So Liz took the architecture list and, 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 and uh, uh, Christina took the architecture off. They came back with their terms and said, no architecture. We just want a box with aluminum front, growies, and we just want what's inside the full depth of the store displayed with lighting. We don't want any architecture that's going to be out of date. You know, and actually when you think about it, graffiti's out of date already. I mean, I, can't, I just couldn't believe it. It's six years old, it's out of date, and the, let alone the old shopping centers, they're so out of date, it's incredible. And I think that's a problem we have, is that the cycle is moving forward, and I would like the architecture here, insofar as possible, to be almost non-existent. You know, and just let, just let what happens inside flow out with light. And, and uh, so this is what it looks like. I mean, it's just crappy old warehouses. Look at this. They even left. Look at this horrible. This is a, a key intersection. 
Everybody walks down here. And look at it. It still has the traces from the tire trucks. You know, look at this. I swear, that didn't cost 10 bucks, that tree. <laughs> and I'd love to tell you this because it is so low budget. For Florida, you know, we do $500 and $800 trees without even thinking about it. There is no such thing as a $10 tree. And yet these people are actually telling in your face, saying, this is all management. It's the people who are here. And uh, I could go on and on about what I saw. I went twice in, in two days. It was so exciting. Okay, here's another model, because we can't all do that. The houses in this neighborhood are largely of a shotgun type. Okay, you know, and one of the things we don't want to do is do architecture that, is, that devalues the existing house, the existing houses. And yet the shotguns are not comfortable. So how do we design a shotgun that raises, you know, on the empty lots? How do we design on an empty lot Increasing the density, but having it look like the existing housing stock. Well, this is a project, we, a problem we set for ourselves in New Orleans. And here's a corner, right, on Dauphine and Gallier. And we designed two L-shaped houses like this. So instead of having a double house side to side, we did an L-shaped house front to back. It has a driveway between the two lots and two cars park on either side. And the whole thing, so you have safe parking, which you need. You have Advanced floor plans that work. Here's a floor plan. This is the yard, master bedroom, etc. You know, big bathroom, upstairs. It fits perfectly. It's not at all uncomfortable like a shotgun, but it looks like a shotgun. You know, it's got the tall ceilings and the simple detailing and everything. And these are, so we, we just brought these. These are experimental units, very successful. I still own one of them. And what happens is that whenever you have two lots, when you have one lot, you can do nothing. You have to park in the front, and you can see the trashy cars in the front. When you have two lots, you can put the houses, increase the density, and have a driveway down the middle, a shared driveway, and park in the back, and the cars are safe. Remember, the buildings are generally safe. It's the cars that are not safe. Walking is safe. You can take care of yourself. You've got eyes. The car's not so lucky. You know, the car is susceptible, so it's important to park the cars. The other great asset is, uh, are the two existing buildings. This is from 1915. It was uh, a uh, uh, place to repair the streetcars, but it was called the Mule Transportation System, if you believe it. You know, the, something like that, right? The Mule Transportation System. And one of the things, we have two buildings there, and one of them is, it was a little streetcar, uh, streetcar uh, repair facility. And I urge you to have names like the streetcar repair facility. Don't come up with, you know, you know Dauphine on the Grove. <laughs> okay, it just doesn't work. You know, these are tough places. Call them what they are. The coolest place in London, which is the New York Times today, is called the Battersea Power Station. Okay, I'm, I live at the Battersea Power Station. That's what's cool. The other one, the other building has the good fortune of being called, and it's the largest available sign, it says, fallout shelter. <laughs> and that could, what could be cooler than that? So uh, perhaps we have one that's called the streetcar facility and the other one the fallout shelter. But that gives you the ethos. Now, these places are great. They're almost perfectly decorated already to the extent that we should actually carefully preserve the rust with shellac and all this wonderful stuff. We need to tear this out. But we also need to work with the fire marshal to not make us enclose all this. Because, you know, there's lots of interpretations in my hand of these old buildings, and if they make us put insulation on the inside to lose the brick, and we have to clad, they even put a hung ceiling in here, it's gone. You end up in something that's more or less like a Marriott, you know, uh, <laughs> convention center. So we have to push back on interpretations that we know exist. And part of the pink zone is that we negotiate for people, for example, the developer, who would get hold of this building and this program that should not ruin the building. The building has nice aspects. Uh, the LSU students did a quite a quite a quite a project with it. This is exactly what we're not doing. We're shown these projects. This is expensive 20th century stuff. And may I say that professors should not be inciting in their students a waste of money that the students are not going to have any money. And this kind of heavy trust, big glass, knock half the building down to be cool. You know, that only happens in a few cities in the world for a few institutions. And the students of a place like LSU should really confront, you know, both 
the virtues and, and not so great destinies of places like Louisiana and deal with what you have and enjoy it. And so this is, you know, this was put in front of our face. I understand the skill set involved, but it's completely irrelevant. And I just have to, you know, well, you cannot not deal with this. Uh, this is what's, what's cool. Even the students, you know, can I tell you, do you think the students want to be in here? You know, in what they designed themselves? Of course not. They want to be here. This is the radio bar. This is almost perfectly done. The only flaw is that the furniture matches. <laughs> they should have actually picked up unmatched furniture. And the outside is fine. We found at least two cool people uh, to prove that uh, to prove that we're okay with cool. Uh, one of the things you find with all this stuff, there's a couple of rules. Um, materials are used authentically in their raw condition. It's raw wood aging. It's raw concrete block aging. It's, you know, when you have mildew, when you have this, when you have a plant, all that. They want the reality, not the sort of plastic surgery that makes everything perfect. And so everything about this, you know, the black metal, the grotty wood and all that is the way to go. The good thing is that it costs less. Um, management is so important, I'd like to give you just a little insight about management. Everything is managed by apps. For example, security in, uh, in Detroit is by apps. What happened is people that live in, a, in an area um, the cops aren't there, as you know. What they do is they get, they get a group of, of people, they push a button, it basically dials a bunch of people. When something suspicious is happening, you push your button, everybody who picks up on the call goes out on the sidewalk and just walks around. And you know, anybody who's misbehaving can't stand company. So they actually secure their own streets block by block by calling each other for help. And it's like Uber. It's like Uber police, the transportation by Uber. So how do you feed yourself in the radio? They don't have food. And they say, why don't we have food? Because it's actually not cost effective to have our own kitchen. It knocks out half the bar, etc. Why don't they do, if you want something, here's a list of the pizza, here's the list of the sushi, here's your list of the food, and we'll deliver it. And if we have a very special night like Friday night, we'll bring in a food truck. And that's the kind of decentralized, specific management that is going to make things possible. The food trucks have emerged out of nothing, and they're by the hundreds in cities now. So this can happen. Look at that. By the way, this is a parking lot in which people are having a good time. <laughs> it's really quite wonderful. Uh, the other thing is uh, the tall ceilings, the tall ceilings of this building of the two existing buildings yield the loss. And the loss could be residential or commercial. There's a certain aesthetic to them. And um, um, our partners here, uh, Norma, Norman uh, Seneved's office, is, has actually been working on the two buildings, both uh, studying them, programming them, and figuring out what can go in them. But it's really a catalog of almost completely cool places. Real loss, not just loss. You know, with balconies on top, really tall ceilings that, uh, in fact, should go to things like, uh, let's say, um, a, uh, a microbrewery. You know, people, you know, there are some ceilings that are four stories tall, open like that. An individual doesn't deserve to get that. You know, so they can have one cool apartment. So the very large spaces in these buildings, of which there are three or four, go for public use, or at least publicly accessible use. And the small ones go into mixed use residential. And I think I'll show you some of that later. The aesthetic is very real, you know. They don't want, they want plywood that looks like plywood. They don't want plywood that looks like, like, like clapper or something else. It's all about authenticity. They'd rather have concrete that looks like concrete than stamped concrete that looks like something else. There's, a, there's an extraordinary, extraordinary taste for the real thing. You know, they'd rather have chi a real chain link fence than a hollow tube fence that pretends to be wrought iron. You know, that's, that's very much what's happening now. And we hope to do that. There's also another thing. This, this is so fantastic that I just want to show you what, how far they're going. This is the Miami Beach Convention Center. This is their seating. And what they do in the hallways is they bring four trees in their pots, you know, 
They're not in, they pile up sand and then they put astroturf on top so that people sit and lie on the mound. Completely spectacular, completely cool, completely comfortable, and really unconventional, but actually so much better than benches. Can you imagine, you know, who's ever looked cool sitting on a bench? Kind of like a loser thing to do. <laughs> you know? A cafe is fine, a bench isn't so great, but a rolling around in the, in the grass, reading a book, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I told you earlier. This is really an image that you should imprint. By the way, if you were to go to Canada and you say, what are the top five things? This is, this is one of my top. A Granville Island, a, a ratty industrial area, now spectacular. <coughs> see this warehouse, see this warehouse, see this warehouse. Look at this in between. The parking is totally opportunistic. Totally. You park where you fit. And it is wonderful, and people are really intelligent. They find the parking. You know, they know where to park. You don't have to sort of stripe everything and, as if everybody was an idiot because they couldn't do it. And so Granville Island is definitely a model for what we're looking at. No sidewalks, you know. Things get narrower, things get straight. This is angled, this doesn't have it, you know. Trees growing up everywhere. In fact, this is unusual. This is the neatest parking lot in Grand Island. Usually it's wherever the cars fit. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to show, what the hell is this? Is this the, uh, oh, this. I haven't seen this image before. Well, let's emphasize this railway. A station will connect this to the airport, to New Orleans, and to a lot of stations in between. Which means people can live in certain places and have jobs somewhere else. This location of ours is the nexus of transportation. The first thing is that the buses that go by this site and stop on this site have access to 103,000 jobs. <coughs> they actually go to 103,000 jobs. So this is like a necktie where everything comes in. It's a nexus. And it's where the old railway station used to be. And it's still a very good place for the railway station that can connect you all the way to New Orleans and all the way to the airport. I know that you're going to do a study that's going to cost $800,000 to figure out where the railway station should be. Just skip it. <laughs> Put it here. Okay, this is where the railway used to be. This is where the buses are. And when you arrive here on the train, if you still need a car, you're not going to take the train. You're going to drive from Hammond. Right? And so what's important is when you arrive, you need to be in that nexus of transportation where the buses are. And then the train will really become a commuter train. People will not actually get out of the train in a different city and use a car. They'll just drive to the city where the car is. So it's, I think it's, it's, this is by so far and away. And by the way, this is a station in Hammond, which I believe there's another image of it here, like this. Uh, they're very simple, but it isn't just a, you know, a shelter. You know, it's a nice place. So when the station is built, something like this would be nice to treat people decently. Uh, the housing in the area, there's a tradition of alleys. Uh, overhead wires are fine, don't worry about them. Uh, and uh, just run them in the alleys and so forth. And uh, anyway, this is, uh, I was showing you an image earlier of houses that would be compatible with this. This is the code that we wrote, the pink zone. And here I am sending it out to the internet, apparently to the right of the internet, in which I am putting the rules, the reward systems of what creates a pink zone that allows developers, smaller developers, to actually act and act quickly. Because you don't have a huge, a huge and horrible uh, um, uh, process in front of you. Um, anyway, the initial, oh, by the way, this, you want the news? This is the process you go through in Baton Rouge to get a building permit after it's been simplified. Okay, this is like the definition of a turnoff. Why would I want to do this unless there is a fortune to be made at the other side? Okay, and that fortune is going to require that I get subsidy. And everybody around here, Louisiana especially, is all about subsidy. To me, subsidy needs to 
get anything done. Well, you need subsidies partially. The government has to interfere, interfere, has to, excuse me, has to help because the government has made economical, economical construction impossible. So the government created a problem with these regulations that actually have, and there, I need to give you an example because I'm going to show you the design and everything, but this idea of the pig zone is very important. So I was speaking to Susanna today, and she was saying, well, there's actually, we have a historic renovation that requires a contract of $25,000 for glass. But anything over $2,500 hits Davis Bacon and, and, the, and the negotiated wages, the negotiated hourly payment, has to be approved by HUD, HUD in Washington. And HUD takes a month. And that's new. So just imagine somebody trying to do something, taking a little bit of federal money. Everything is beyond capacity. It's certainly beyond my capacity. You know, and I'm paid to kind of work out this stuff. And I've done it all my life. Imagine a young person. They'll just crash. So it's our job in the pink zone to take this and put pre-permit all the viable possibilities so that the person who comes in says sign here and go interview the bulldozer operator or go talk to your bricklayers. We'll take care of this. But there's going to be concierge permitting. Give me the plans. I'll make sure they'll come back to you in a week or two and you'll be ready to go. And we've discussed it with, with regulators already in Baton Rouge, and they're so ready for this, it's incredible. Now remember, we're not reforming this categorically. We're creating a pilot project that doesn't set precedent if it, if it doesn't work. But let us, in one little place, in one little six-acre place, could we please experiment with something efficiently, and something that's really efficient, cost-effective, fast, and see whether it works out, and that's what the thing zone is. So this is the sketches of the first uh, of the first day. Uh, this had a couple of interesting attributes. The two buildings are here. We thought a plaza entering would be nice, just like the one in Miami. And just like the one in Miami, this is the railway track. We said, let's put all the parking on the side and all the parking on the side, and let's keep the center primarily pedestrian. And then we thought, well, that's pretty radical. You know, all the cars out of the way, big parking lots again. And so we responded to this one. This is what it looked like. It was very regular, you know. But those of you who know how to read plans, you know that, that, you know, if you look at the figures, if you look at the gray, it's not so interesting. But if you look at the series of squares, it really is pretty good. So this is the first sketch for the first day. And then we came up with this other scheme, which was a checkerboard in which the buildings, these are the two existing buildings that gave us the hints as to where the others are. Remember, you can see it's just slots. So it's a checkerboard. This is the railway car, the railway line. This checkerboard creates squares, which are the parking lots. So within them, of course you have cars, but you also have trees, and the cars are on gravel, and everybody has a long view. So if you look at these buildings, the buildings actually, they all have long views. They don't have the urban condition in which somebody gets some good apartments in front and in the back, but all the windows on the side have, are facing another building at 10 feet away. So this, this checkerboard actually gives you the long views by bringing, paradoxically, by bringing the parking lot within where you are. Because as I said, eight cars, eight cars and the good trees aren't going to kill you. And so that's, that's the second one that has the checkerboard. And as I said, this is not rigid. You can see that the sizes are different, the sizes are determined by the two existing buildings and the roads coming in. Okay, so these are the final concepts, which are really not final, but this is how far we got. Okay, so there are two. One of them, this is our two existing buildings, one of them picks up, there's a certain block size there. There's a block size that's 150 feet by 75. Mike, am I right? What? Okay, I'm sorry, 150 by 300. It's a 150 by 300 block. Now, Entergy, when they bought the site, obliterated the grid. You know, they took it away because they made a campus. The railway track actually allowed, forced the grid to kind of stagger, and uh, it dissipates. 
But if you restore the grid and you get the standard block of 150 by 300, as we did here, hypothetically, you can actually have a complete plug and play. You know, for every half block, we have a kit, and you can do what you like. The other scheme retains a checkerboard, and you can see that it's all about this. Now, the other scheme, the existing buildings are here. We even kept the existing, the existing pre-secondary house. This is an out parcel. This, by the way, is the Little Rock uh, Baptist Church, which actually is all in the wrong place, and we put them. I think that this is a church that owns a lot of this land, okay? A lot of this land here. Both sides of this, this church uses this for parking lots. We think that with this plan, we're, we're revaluing their land to such an extent that they'll be able to build a real church, and so we made a place where they actually sit within our pattern and give it to a square. Okay, so those are the two. This is, the, uh, this is one of them. You know, we do it. This is a this is a tank. This is a uh, uh, existing water tank. We go by now. So this is our checkerboard, okay? Like this, buildings have different footprints. They make lots of different squares. By the way, there are roads that go through everywhere. Okay, so the fire marshal can always get to every building in a paved road with their big engine. But in between, there's no reason to have roads everywhere. And in here, what you see in white is gravel draining perfectly with trees shading. Okay, so that's the way we imagine it. Very inexpensive, very ecologically adept. And we did all the calculations. Then we realized that when the overhead power, power lines knocked out all of our housing here, we ended up with a huge amount of surplus parking. So basically, these park themselves, but there's also an additional there's additional parking if you want to go to three or four stories. And this whole thing, it throws us into crisis. Because what happens, the good thing about the three or four stories, you get more density. The bad thing is that you're knocking out the small developers. And you see the minute you know, the buildings are now, as you'll see in the latest renderings, unfortunately, we're now doing real buildings. Now, normally we would say, aren't we happy to do big buildings? I'm not so happy that even our little old checkerboard scheme because of this, paradoxically, for the first time in our life, we have enough parking, and now we have to go denser. And I think we have to really think about it. Only this is on the site, the two existing buildings. These other ones are on our site. It's a total of 72,000 square feet at two stories, or about 110,000 at three stories, which is a nice amount of space, depending on how you cut it up whether you cut it up into 1,000 square foot units or 5,000 square foot professional offices, it's a lot of space. And that's just in the site. Now, something to bear in mind, we want this to happen so quickly that while this is also part of the planning, whatever problems there are, actually negotiating ownership and speaking to the neighbors and all the things that have to be spoken about, this is not in the first phase. This is in the first phase. Nothing outside the site okay, is going to hold this up. You know, we're not waking up any sleeping dogs. Now, once you see it, once the community sees this, kicks the tires, decides it's cool, then the whole dynamic is reverse engineer. You're welcome to join us. But we're not going to push to say, please, please do what we say. Okay, we say, no, you do whatever you want. Okay, but if you happen to like what we do, then you are coherently designed to join us. The other scheme is this. This is a hypothetical. Again, this is the two. Notice how this one, actually, you don't even know where the site begins or ends. Because what we did is we restored the existing grid. And as I said, each half block has a different possibility, which we fully explored. That's the new grid. But this is the existing grid. We just completed it. Uh, by the way, Mike, one of the things we need to do here is show which streets exist and which are new. You know, we need to change the colors so we can actually make up. It's surprising how few new streets need to be added. So this is what we, this is what it's like. Every half block has the statistics right here and it's fully parked. So you have carpet housing, you have wide townhouses, you have shallow townhouses that are actually tucked under. The bottom half is the first floor, the top half is the second floor. 
This is hotels. Would you like to build an inn or a hotel? This is an elegant office building. I mean, excuse me, apartment buildings. Uh, these are different kinds of live work units. These are actually proper retail. Uh, these are a kind of apartment building that our friend John Anderson has been doing, which actually is all about thresholds. He's discovered that if you do an apartment building with only four apartments per floor, you don't need an elevator and you only need one stair. So you can do a three-story walk-up. Three-story walk-up essentially built as if it were a you know, McMansion somewhere, with one, one stair, etc. So one of the things the Pink Zone is going to do is it's going to really study what are the thresholds and advise the potential developers, if you stay underneath this threshold, you're going to be okay. You can build it with you know, you know, the carpenter you know. And so, and then over here, there are the, these are the L-shaped units that we build in the bywater. These are the perimeter blocks, pretty affordable apartments, etc. But this is the plug and play kit. And here they are developed in three dimensions. These are the floor plans, and this is what they look like in 3D. And one of the sort of jokes we were telling, I was, I was speaking to, to James, who was, uh, you know, would be a wonderful, uh, would be a wonderful uh, master developer. And I said, you just have to act. He says, what do I do? I says, well, you act like a waiter. You bring the menu and say, sir, we have these, these things in our menu today. In fact, we're a little low. We're a little low on affordable housing, so we'll give you a special. <laughs> and uh, actually, you can have uh, whatever side you want. And you use your architect. Your side is your architect. And yes, it can be clabbered. Yes, it can be brick, which is a city, which like a mustard or mayonnaise. You know, but just, just think waiter, okay? And you'll see how well this works. And then the land is what it's worth. You know, you can, it's very clear what it is. And if, by the way, and if they need money, if they can't, if they're terrific people, but they can't get the loans, you can co-develop with them. You can become a co-developer. For 51%, you can put in the land. You can actually sign for the, sign for the, you know, the credit. You can sign for the, for the loan. The developer does all the work and you're 50 50 partners. And it's all about getting younger people to come in. So here's more of them. Again, very crude. But actually, it's a beautiful system. It's completely rational. And I want to say one thing. This is actually, you say, well, if you came up with 12, why aren't there 20 others? There are 20 others. First of all, because there's two disciplines. One is, you meet the parking requirement. And that knocks out a huge number of buildings. You know, you have to do 1.5 per unit or four per thousand of commercial. So we meet that. And the second rule, which is really important, you can't just park anywhere you want. You have to park behind, you know, behind the frontage. And with those two disciplines, you end up with about, in this case, about 12 possibilities. This is what happened today, this morning, when we, do you remember the checkerboard that, we, that I was showing you this morning? looks like a kind of little hippie cottages. Well, it turns out that if you put a wall on it to keep the car safe at night, this is, this is where you end up the parking. If you put a wall on it in the parking courts, you end up with something that is awesomely elegant that we weren't expecting. So this wall, you know, with the extra apartment, is a quite amazing look for the checkerboard. You see how, what happened to the checkerboard once we added the wall? It's wonderful. All the parking is there. And here's another thing that is so interesting. Do you realize the new urbanism always has the parking in the back? The front door is in the front, the parking is in the back. You always enter from the back door, right? Yeah, my guests enter from the front, but I enter from the back. Well, look at these. Look at this building. Look at this building is actually entered from here. You go down the allee. Here's where the cars are. So you have an elegant LA with eight, eight or ten cars parked here, and your front door is here. This one is entered from here, and this one is entered from here, and so forth. So here you have a forecourt, and just imagine if white gravel, trees on top, nice cars, and a stoop receiving you, you know, 150 feet away. Super elegant, and the car is where you want it, which is in the front. So we're very excited about this building type. And so, just imagine that checkerboard, which was all very loose, is now has now become something else. Very rough. By the way, this drawing took, it's amazing, this drawing took 45 minutes. <laughs> That's the reason we were late today. 
It didn't, it, you know, it didn't exist at 5 o'clock. But look at the elegance of this. This is like move over New Orleans. <laughs> it's actually New Orleans with good light for a change. Because New Orleans, you know, those, uh, the French Quarter is wonderful streetscape, but it's pretty dark and dingy and wet in there. You know, those courtyard, those courtyard houses aren't breathing well. And this would have both. This would have an extraordinary, so I am, we are, I mean, the whole team is so excited about this checkerboard. It's really incredible. What else do we have? Oh, and then the streets, okay. Another bit of extraordinary good luck is that governor, Government Street is now essentially funded to be traffic calm, to be, uh, to be being pedestrian friendly. And they're thinking of, we found some early drawings that say it's going to go from four lanes to three lanes with some bike, bike paths. And then we immediately started running across problems because we said, well, actually, we don't really need that. We don't need it to be at the center. We don't need space. Our neighbor needs space. The school here has a terrible problem already with stacking for the right turn. Why are you removing a lane? And so what, what we want to add to this mix is that the DOT should not come up with one solution and ream it all the way through. You know, this is too different. This is different from this is different from this is different. And you need a whole series of street sections that alter according to context. And another one of the things that has happened, there's so much bus activity here that something like, in this stretch here, there's something like 118 bus stops. And apparently, everything is stuck. Because what's happening is the bus stops on the sides of the streets are actually destroying the bike paths. Because the bike paths are between the sidewalk, the, 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 the buses are blocking them. So Christina drew and said, well, you know, the streetcars in Portland and in many good cities are not on the side, they're in the middle of the street, so that people can access them on both sides. So whether you're going to the left or to the right, you can actually get on the bus. And we can, we can get the bus layover, the bus layover is like this, put them on the center of the street, like some of the streetcars, and clear the edges for the bike lanes. And so this is a proposal. Now you say, well, are, am I not going to get run over going to the bus? Is that you've never been run over crossing the street. Why should you be run over going to the middle of the street? Well, that's actually half as hard as crossing the whole street. <laughs> this is just like calm down, you know, and uh, et cetera. And also remember, it's not going to be government street at 55 miles an hour. It's going to be government street at 35 miles an hour because it's now traffic calm. Uh, and these are the sections. These are the sections that we're proposing at the center of the street, the layovers. See the new trolleys on both sides. And then, so we're actually contributing to the debate by saying let's have quite a few different drawings. These are some of the early sketches that we were doing to give you a sense of the space of the place and of an architecture which is really pretty glassy. You know, these are the existing, these are the two existing buildings. The space between them is too wide. We can put a market, an open market between them. We can add additional porches. And then the new buildings, again, you have to think about this. Boxes with a lot of glass and aluminum storefront. You know? And what really, really counts is not the architecture, but the lighting and the materials. You know? And just keep them as boxes. And uh, uh, Norman, uh, and I have been discussing that some of the commercial buildings, if we do it right, might be as little as $70 a square foot. And what that does is that allows businesses to start. So it isn't just the developers being young developers, it's also the people who start businesses being young because we can do things. These are the buildings, the two existing buildings. This is one of the two, this is the complex one. And so Norman's office, um, Shenberg, Norman Schenberg's office is actually already done what is best here. So actually, this is also, this is, I mean, if you were to say, can we get going Monday? I say, yeah, come on, Mr. Developer. We have a building, let's go in it, and let's talk about what we think should go there, and this is what we're charging, and when are you gonna finish? You know, uh, and remember too that the two buildings are serious. The two buildings are serious renovations that's gonna be done by big developers. It's the other stuff that actually we're referring to for regular folk. 
And the second building is fantastic. Oh, this needs to be upstairs. Be upstairs everywhere. The other building is much easier to, uh, to actually deal with. So this is the same building you're looking at, and it does different things in every floor. Lots of half levels, really very cool. Okay, so that's what we have. Uh, we, also did, we also designed a timeline. And as you can tell, uh, we're assuming there's going to be no, by the way, there's been no resistance. Like we haven't had a negative thing said all week. So I don't know who is going to invent something to hold this project up. <laughs> you know where it's going to come from, but whatever it is, they haven't emerged. But we'll have a timeline. We have a timeline that actually is two years, and it says you begin in, you begin in February. You know, get your act together in February. You start actually infrastructure's design. You have the committee that guides it. And by uh, and in two years' time, you're already on the second phase. People are living in the first phase, and you've broken ground on the second phase in two years' time. It's perfectly doable, you know, but it, it requires I don't know, it requires, I don't know why things take so long, because there's no good explanation, and, but we're going to keep an eye on that. So two things are going to happen here. If there are two projects here, this is the more conventional one, the more exciting one. I'm biased towards the more exciting one, because I think it's going to put it on the map. So not only do I think that those squares and courtyards are wonderful, it's going to put this on the map, and if this is done as a fully pink zone, you know, with the red tape reduced, that is what everybody's talking about. And uh, we have a real pro. And by the way, one thing that I love, and I want to repeat this, it isn't Andres writing a pink zone. It's, uh, it's, it's Fregonese writing a pink zone. Mr. Fregonese writing a pink zone. But he's a grown up. Okay, so that's going to be very helpful. Uh, could we have uh, questions and then? And then Chris Bay. <laughs> yes, please. Sir. What's your thoughts about how this project uh, would interact with existing communities on all sides of it? It's open to all sides. All the streets, in fact, it's more open than it is now. We're bringing, we're bringing all the community streets into the site, which are now fenced off. And uh, as we approach the land, which is not the, uh, the energy land, the building types become more similar to the adjacent ones, so that the people on the sides don't, don't feel imposed upon. Now, if you're, uh, the, there, there are some specific um, activities, like for example, I mentioned Shiloh Church. And the Shiloh Church north-south has its own ideas, and uh, we are, we'll just support those, whatever they are. You know, one of their ideas is senior housing. Great idea, so we'll do that. But the interaction is going to be that it's all open. And the ideal would be to actually start businesses that the whole community would feel comfortable coming to. You know, so yeah, not just people from somewhere else. It's not a shopping center, it should be. Now, uh, we have to admit that in the end, this raises real estate value. It actually gentrifies the place, and I think uh, I think we're too old to say that this doesn't gentrify the place. You know, the real estate values go up. People are going to want to sell their houses for more than they would get, and the community molds. You know, and I don't I don't know any way to prevent that. When things get better, prices go up. So, I want to be real honest about that. What else? Thank you. Just a quick question in regards to, I guess along those same lines, the, the fears of, I don't think you're going to have much pushback because individuals are waiting and excited about something to happen in this area. However, at the same time, I am curious to know about what ideas or suggestions you do have for um, community involvement, specifically making sure that those individuals that are in there that may have the fear of gentrification, what does this mean? Are we going to be able to to still be here? Um, and just what all of this means for the community. How, what is, should that community outreach component look like and consist of? Because that's huge. Well, we uh, uh, this time and last time we met with the majority of the churches of the in this community. I think we met with six, six out of seven. 
and um, there was that concern. But they said, we're going to wait, do what you think is right, and we'll, we'll come and see. So right now, the feedback will come when they see this proposal. But this we also know, only 30% of the houses are inhabited by owners. Owner occupies are 30%. The other 70 or so percent are renters. You know, and one of the things that I've always learned is that sometimes you do an awful lot for the renters, and by the time you're done, the renters aren't there anymore. There's something else has happened. So I think what we need to take care of is make sure that those who are, who are owner occupiers really have a voice. And um, I would think that in, to some extent the churches give them a voice, you know. You know, they, they seem to be represented by the various pastors and so forth. And that's the best we can do. But we're going to be really honest. You know, this is what's going to happen. This is when it might happen. But also bear something else in mind. This entire project can happen within the energy site. You know, when people want us, it's the people outside who say, come and help us also. You know, it's about being asked to come out. At the moment, we're not pushing to come out. And I think that's, that's where we're going to interact. So now that we're doing this, would you like us to, to really have a look at your place? So that in two or three years' time, it gets better. Oh, I'm sorry, and you, this, you also have to speak, yeah? What else? Yes, go ahead. You have the mic, though. Oh, yes, um, thank you. That is a, uh, I mean, you had a very good, brilliant, beautiful presentation. And my question sort of falls along some of the lines of the previous question. That is that after, I guess, having been, was it Mr. Dwani? Yeah. I'm Luther I'm Stewart. After having been a uh, resident of that movie in Southern Louisiana, approximately four years, which I mentioned in the previous presentation that you did. Uh, my concern would be along the lines of whether or not this would be viewed as an invasion, uh, an gentrification, urban renewal, or human removal. And that's one of the fears that I see happening. You know, just having raised two sons who attended Southern Lab, I have no political or economic interest in this particular project other than to see the community as a whole. Yeah. The city in general benefit from a project such as this. Okay, uh, one of my the last, my last, no, no, but, no, 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 let you ask the other question. You're asking too many questions. Let me, okay. let me, well, no, 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 let me, let me ask you. No, 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 wait. I just want to answer your first before you go to the next. Let me, and then you'll do the second question. Okay, the first question is this. The way to think about this is scenarios. You know, what are the options? One option is doing nothing. Just doing nothing. What happens if you do nothing? If you do nothing, the community, in a linear way, continues to degenerate. So you have to compare what's being proposed with what happens if you do nothing. Now, the second scenario may be build more affordable housing here. Build affordable housing. And we say, well, what does that achieve? Well, the price is probably stabilized. Some people get in. It never looks like the community. It's always a different voter. And then we study that. And then the other thing is, what do we do to make this place cool? What does that do? Does it attract younger people? What are the implications of that? Do the prices go up? Who will lose their houses? But I'd like to say one thing very clearly now. Okay? And I'm going to just state it. Whenever we do these projects and we speak to the people who own the houses, they want gentrification. There's no ambiguities, okay? Other people may not want gentrification because, for example, the churches may lose their, their, con their congregations. But if you go straight to the owner and you say, Madam, when is the generational transition going to happen to your house? Would you like it to be worth $30,000 when the time comes? Or would you like it to be worth $70,000? I have never run across a person that doesn't want a $70,000 or the 140. And I think one of the things we owe people is to talk directly to the owners and not just to the people who represent them, because they're not the same thing. So I just want to make that clear. Right, and I, I agree with you uh, on that in general principle. The, the point I wanted to make was not before I you know, had to... The second question. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't really a question, it was more or less a suggestion because you have a pink zone. There were five things that sort of came to my mind that would make this basically unstoppable. 
if we wanted to pursue it because we're beginning to appear like it's sort of top-down rather than grassroots. Uh, the first and the second suggestion would be probably, can we be sure that the planning commission and the firm is doing this, is representative of the demographics of the community? Second, will this be able to increase the employment of residents in that area? The fourth is, would it be, would the children of residents in that area, even though it's only 30%, would they be able to attend the proper amendment? So I'm still again dealing with education, well, employment, and economics. Well, okay, and, no, and I'm saying that because I think if you took if that were part of the yeah. the overall strategy, yeah. I think you would have. I just don't see where it would be. Okay. First of all, this is about as bottom up as it comes. Uh, we've been meeting. I've hardly had time to design. I've been not doing nothing but meeting for four days, and I've been. And the last time I was here, I did nothing but meet. So you have to say categorically, this is not top down. This is the bottom up as it comes, almost to the point of inefficiency, which we don't want to have. The second thing, which I think bears saying, is there's an awful lot of 20th century talk going on, which is, yeah, we've got to have, you mentioned, is this, is this representative of the community? You know, what's the racial makeup of the team? What's the racial? Let me tell you what the 21st century is about. It's economic. Okay, it's economic, and the cut at those who have and those who don't have, whether they're black or white or Chinese or whatever, it's who has and who doesn't have. And what we're after in this project is equality of economic opportunity for the young, wherever they come from. Now, the old folk are the old folk in that neighborhood, and they've got their churches and they've got their retirements, whatever they have, they're set. But the young folk here, you know, exactly the children that you spoke about, when they come here and they see, first of all, we're going to love them to set up businesses or help them. Now, if they fail, they fail. But to give them a chance is fantastic. But somebody was telling me today, very tellingly, they said, one of the pastors was saying, I'd love to have our children come in and see people that have started young, small businesses. That's what they need to see. They need to see that opportunity. So this particular thing is not about providing 600 units of affordable housing. We know how that ends. Okay, that ends in a slump. This is about creating a matrix for the young people to actually advance financially. And the unhappy people these days are the ones that don't have the economic opportunity. This is, I see this emerging. The 30-year-olds need jobs, and they don't want to work for the man, for the corporation. They want to start their own businesses. And I'd love it if this place were like that. Well, it's not the only way to do it, but it's, I think, the way this should be done. What do you think about that? Well, you know, I, yeah. Yeah, your point on the economics, I totally agree with you. Yeah. And, uh, I'm only, my point is trying to make it such that it's not you. Yeah. Um, and architecture deals with perception. I think you guys are very good at that. Yeah. But there's another perception that hey, you also have to deal with, and it's not architectural. That is, how is the community and how people who are residents and still have family members who are residents, how are they going to deal with it? And my suggestions were to consider these things also, as well as that, also affordable housing for the 30 or 35 percent that would want to remain there. Because once you have an economic stratus like this, it's very obvious that most of the people okay. who live in the area are not going to qualify economically. Yeah, but well, you know why it doesn't qualify economically? Because you can't build affordable housing in this country, because the government doesn't let you. I, I okay, and that's all I do. My architecture is affordable housing. And I hardly ever show it because I'm embarrassed to tell you what it costs. Okay, I'm just embarrassed because the affordable housing I've built costs twice as much for private sector housing costs. So I'm just sick of it. You know, I'm just sick of the, of the, of the, of the credits and the bureaucrats and the lawyers and everything else. And what I like to do is go straight in with minimum subsidy, not loading up and get the energy of youth to get going and build the stuff. Like just get off their back. And I forgot to tell you this anecdote. Detroit's doing pretty well because they have no bureaucrats left. They can't afford them. And the young people are coming in from Brooklyn and getting things done fantastically well. They're, they're fixing houses without permits and doing a great job and starting businesses without grease traps. You know, and the food is still good. Nobody's dying. And that's, that's the model. The model is that one. We need to go back. We can't afford 1990 anymore. 
We need to go back to something like 1970 or 1950 economics, where somebody could just build a house and start a business without so many papers. So, affordable housing needs to be built. This may not be the site for it. You. Uh, but I'm very grateful for the difficult yeah. question. Because most people haven't asked difficult questions all week, so I'm grateful for it. Yeah. You mentioned the timeline for next year. What's the top priority that would jumpstart this? And then the flip side, what's the potential obstacle that might be regulated? You know, what is it that when we leave, and we do an amazing amount of work in seven days, the next step takes seven months. 